Thanks so much, Anthony, for that um, introduction and for, for organizing, setting up this event. Um, so it's, um, I'm very excited to be able to have this conversation, which I think is going to cover um, quite a range of, of really big topics, um, which um, feature both in um, classical German philosophy, so philosophy from Kant to Hegel, um, as that's um, appropriated and then transformed, and we can talk about in what ways transformed exactly by Karl Marx. Um, and the also figure, I think, um, in your work, um, Karen, um, sort of very centrally, and we'll see what some of those sort of big topics are. But I, I thought we could start from humanism. Um, and maybe what we could do is, is work up from humanism to the idea of um, defending um, what you call humanist social critique. Um, and one thing that immediately struck me is quite um, striking um, about uh, the very notion of, of humanist social critique and the idea of defending it in kind of in the current context is um, both the, the sort of general point that humanism uh, means all sorts of different things to all sorts of different people. And so um, I'm sort of intrigued as to um, uh, how you're conceiving it um, specifically, um, but also because in the Marxist tradition, um, there is a way of thinking about Marx, which is quite widespread, and it finds maybe its kind of starkest form in, in Louis Althusser, the um, French Marxist theorist, um, according to which, you know, the early Marx is a humanist, He's, he advances a humanist philosophy, um, and that what makes Marx's mature work so important is precisely that he breaks through out of this, this humanist philosophy through what Althusser calls an epistemological rupture. And through this rupture, we come, we come into this new world, which is completely sort of unforeseeable and transforms the nature of science somehow. And the whole point of doing that is to leave you know, mere humanist philosophy, although that was all very well in, in its way and, and owed a lot to Hegel and so on. And the, the idea is to leave all of that behind. Um, so in that sense, it, you know, for a certain audience, it will even be sort of provocative to defend the idea of humanist social critique. So, so the first thing I wanted to ask you was really, um, what do you mean by humanism and what motivates you to mobilize the concept of humanism or a concept of humanism in the interest of social critique? Thanks so much for that, Christoph. Um, I think that's the perfect place to start. Um, your question, along with, I think, Anthony's introduction, where he said that humanism is sort of seen as, as chirpy, I really like that word, <laughs> um, um, sort of is, is a really nice way to, to set up um, the, the a, di a different approach to humanism that I think we can find um, certainly um, in the work of Marx, but in the way that I read Marx sort of as continuous with the, the project of uh, German idealism. So maybe the first thing I'll say um, before I get to some of the Althusser stuff is that some of the ways in which I want to rethink the question of humanism sort of around Marx's work is to not begin with this puzzle about human nature or human essence, right? So a lot of conceptions of humanism pretty much start there. We imagine what we take to be um, essential or unchanging about our human nature. We almost always get it wrong. <laughs> Even when we don't get it wrong, right? We maybe say some trivial things. Um, but I actually think that there is a different way around approaching this question. Um, first of all, as you, you yourself in your own work, Christoph, you know, you the, the, the difficulty of, of Marx's original term Gattungswesen is sort of a very complicated, it, itself a very complicated question and whether or not it, the best way to understand it is about a question of essence is itself already up for debate. Um, but I've begun to come to think about the question of humanism in, I'll just call it classical German philosophy, um, really in terms of um, a method, um, that their, their humanism is a sort of methodological approach to, to philosophy, a, a methodological approach to the question of critique. Um, and the humanism part really for, for me revolves around the importance of this concept of self-consciousness, um, the importance of the way in which we as human beings, but I'm willing to sort of depart from Marx and say maybe human beings aren't the only ones who can do this, but for now we'll just stick with human beings, that what is distinctive about um, 
what is important um, about human beings and thinking about social criticism is that we relate to our conditions. We relate to the structures. We relate to all sorts of natural, social, historical conditions in a kind of self-conscious and reflective manner so that we are never just merely sort of passively, right? <laughs> passively creative or created or acted upon by conditions, whether those are natural conditions, social conditions, historical conditions, social structures, as we might now call it, um, but that we relate to them in this sort of self-conscious reflective manner. Um, and I think for me, that is the, best way, I think it's the best way of approaching the question of humanism in Marx. It shows the deep philosophical continuities between him and the tradition of German philosophy that came before him, obviously, um, you know, Kant, this idea of a critical philosophy, um, which gets developed in different ways through, through Hegel and the German idealists. But also, I think, um, moving on to the Althusser part of your question, um, it is, I think deeply significant that even in Marx's mature, right, Marx thinks of his mature, we, we call it the critique, it's the critique of political economy. Um, the fact that he continues, right, he is very, I think, very self-consciously continuing to appropriate this, this critical tradition of German philosophy. So when he calls cap the three volumes of Capital a critique of political economy, I think we should read that very literally. Um, why is, what makes it a critique of political economy in the manner of say Kant's critique of pure reason or you know all, all of Kant's critique or in general this idea of a critical project. And I think the way that I want it, what makes it critical is precisely that of course capital is going to present right a very complicated, we can call it structural account um, of what political economy is, how it works, <laughs> how it produces and reproduces itself. But at the center of it is all about, right, the, 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 the heart, the beating heart and soul of it, what drives it is self-conscious human labor. Um, and if we take, you know, I think there's a way in which at first glance, if we think of humanism only in terms of questions of human nature, and then we take Althusser's account as saying, look at the sophisticated structural so-called scientific approach, um, it can seem like an advance, but I actually think that the, the Althusserian reading takes away what is emancipatory and, and liberatory about Marx's social critique in the first place, which is not just that, yes, capitalism is a very complicated social structure um, that acts on us in all kinds of ways, um, but most, right, the, Marx's sort of point from the very beginning and throughout it's, is that it is a social structure that human beings themselves created. And that's right, without that, then right, that's what's supposed to help us become aware that we can, we, that's also something we can change. Um, it's not just, it is not just like any other natural law. <laughs> uh, it is not an eternal social structure. It's a social structure we, cre we created and it acts on us in certain ways, but right, it's, it's reciprocal. We can in turn, right, rationally, self-consciously reappropriate it, transform it. And I think that's what's important to me about the humanist Marx. So I take it, I mean, your response to Althusser will be something like, well, rupture is certainly not the way to think of Marx's development. Right? Um, but so I want to come on to the, the questions that you raised about critique and how, um, how Marx can be situated in relation to you know, the idea of critique that's inaugurated by Kant. So kind of, you know, auspiciously, <laughs> and the idea of a critical philosophy. Um, but before we do that, I thought maybe we could just um, linger a little bit more over the, the concept of Gattungswesen, which you mentioned, right, which is, we normally translate as species being, but could also be translated as genus being, um, given the, the way in which those terms are used in the 19th century in various languages. Um, and you, you also spoke about um, the significance of self-consciousness for, for humans. Um, and I just wondered if you could say a bit more about how we should understand um, species being or Gattungswesen and its role. If it's not something like, um, well, you know, here we are as human beings trying to get along in a world, you know, riven by all sorts of conflicts and difficulties. Um, um, but, you know, we're, we're to somehow remind ourselves that we belong to some kind of category. Um, 
that we have a certain kind of nature and we'd, we'd somehow lost we somehow lost sight of that i somehow forgotten that i was human um right because the 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 species being that we are is the human right um and that i mean that would seem that would seem very odd so so what is it about um species being that's so important for marx as, as, a, as a concept here so i would in pretty much every and there really aren't there isn't that much text, right? So in, in all of the texts that is, is all, pretty much always discussed with respect to species being, Marx never actually says that species being is about human nature. So of course the term itself is complicated because basin can mean being or essence, um, something that we have, something that we are. So there's a lot of interesting ambiguity there, but I think, you know, I, I, I can say of I can say of myself that I am a Gattungswesen, and I can say to you that you are one, right? So it also it's also an individual. Exactly, an individual. Yeah. Um, but I think all of those ambiguities are helpful, right? I don't think it, it would be a question of trying to resolve all of those ambiguities, but that something about the ambiguous nature of the term itself can maybe help us. But the other thing I was going to say is that right. So Marx always, if I were to give a one sentence definition of of species being for Marx. He always defines it basically in terms of self-consciousness. <laughs> um, that's help. What you just said is also helpful in the sense that it can refer not right, not not just to some sort of you know, right universal species essence or all of us, but it refers to an individual. Um, the 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 connection that Marx always draws between species being or and self-consciousness, or we could even say self-consciousness and species consciousness, I think is something that hasn't, um, I wouldn't exactly say, it's, maybe it's been overlooked. We, it, 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 to me, it's, 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 a, it's always a big question mark for me and I, I'm always uh, wanting people to say more about this. Um, and so that's just to pick up on what I said earlier that although it can seem like it's this problem about human nature and human essence, I think it's a problem about self-consciousness. Um, it's a problem about what it means for an individual to be to what is it for an individual to be self con to be conscious of themselves? I think one of the arguments that Hegel and both Hegel and Marx made was that it is not really possible for me to be conscious of myself as an I or as an individual without also in some way in it, right? And it can be degrees of explicitness. It can be completely implicit or unconscious. It can be articulated um, to different degrees. But I think one of the arguments that both Hegel and Marx want to make is that there's no way of understanding what self-consciousness even is if we don't think of it somehow as being bound up with or connected with species consciousness, right? Being aware of myself as an individual of a particular kind. Um, so that's a very, that that can make the problem of Gattungswesen sound very abstract, but I think, right, very quickly, Marx shows us how concrete it can be. And the one of here's one going back to more retorts against Althusser. There's just no, not even textual evidence to me to suggest that the importance of self-consciousness ever disappears from the way that Marx thinks about human productive activity. Um, the, the theory of historical materialism revolves around, right, right? So we start with real historical individuals and what do these real historical uh, indiv social individuals do? They reproduce themselves self-consciously, right? They self-consciously produce um, their means of subsistence. They self-consciously appropriate the conditions of production. So, that if we think about the problem of species being and humanism in those terms, there's also just no textual evidence to me that there's something like an, um, an, an epistem epistemological rupture, even in Capital in the central chapter where he talks about the labor process. It's all about the, diff the difference between us and the beavers and the bees, presumably. Again, I don't, I don't need to agree with Marx on that specific point, um, but the, the importance of self-conscious laboring activity, self-conscious productive activity, um, just to me never disappears as a kind of centerpiece that allows us to understand um, his critique of political economy. I, I was going to say, I mean, it seems like there is some textual evidence in Capital that he continues to mark the distinction between um, self-conscious productive activity and other forms of productive activity, which then leaves open the question about you know, which are the ones that fall under these particular categories. And as you say, that's um, um, that's that's a kind of further question that we 
that we might ask. Um, I'm, I'm not going to ask you about um, other animals, but, but maybe that other people may want to to come back <laughs> when we expand the circle right uh, later on. Um, but I wanted to to ask you about critique because um, you know there's something kind of incredibly arresting about the way in which you know in 1781. Um, um, inaugurates this new project um, by which apparently reason is is brought to its own tribunal. It stands before its own tribunal, um, and he inaugurates this thing critical philosophy. Um, and it's clear it's a very comp it's a very complex history, right? From from Kant right through um, Hegel through the young Hegelians, the way in which the the term critique and the concept of critique um, gets um, reused and transformed and so on. Um, and I suppose what I wanted to ask you about was a kind of specific issue um, about the nature of critique and, and what it can do and how far it can reach. Um, because, I mean, in the Kantian case, it seems clear that it's, that it's a, an, an epistemological notion that's to do with thought. Um, and Kant, um, sorry, and Marx, you know, thematizes in um, this very nice text, the uh, critique of Hegel's philosophy of right and introduction, which is the introduction to a long sort of sprawling fragmentary text that he never published, but this is a kind of self-standing piece that he did publish uh, in 1844. Um, and there he talks about um, um, the, the weapon of critique, and he talks about critique by weapons. Um, and this is one of the places where um, Marx is grappling with the issue of um, how social critique, how the you know the attempt to to make an impact on social conditions needs to turn material. Um, so I wanted to ask you um, to comment on on how you um, conceive what's going on there. And I'm I'm just going to read you the passage because I think it's um, such a great passage to be reminded of and has sort of have in our minds. Um, he writes the weapon of critique cannot, of course, replace critique by weapons. Material force must be overthrown by material force. But theory also becomes a material force as soon as, as, soon as it has gripped the masses. Um, so there seems to be some notion here that theory in some way can become a material force. But you know, what does that mean? And how did that relate to your way of thinking about social critique? Um, it's great because you you sent me this passage and now I'm just going to read the rest of it <laughs> because in a way the answer to the part of the answering the question sort of will take us there take us there right so how does theory become a material force it needs to grip the masses how how does it grip so then the question is how does it grip the masses it gri grips the masses as soon as it demonstrates ad hominem that it demonstrates ad hominem as soon as it becomes radical to be radical is to grasp the root of the matter, but the human is the root of the human himself, themselves. Um, so I think there's there's sort of a lot of different. So the one question is about how theory or philosophy can become material. Um, you also started with this Kantian notion, right? So this Kantian. I, I've been trying to connect the way that Marx thinks about critique with how Kant and some of the post-Kantians thought about critique. And you rightly talked about some of the limitations um, of, of right, Kant's project is purely epistemological. One of the things I love about this text, uh, this text that the, this passage comes from is how many different, there's, I think at least three different places where Marx very explicitly is making reference to Kant's conception of critique and uh, re-articulating it for himself. <laughs> so in a very early part of that text, he basically talks about a, a Copernican turn, but his Copernican turn is also sort of similar to this passage about right being radical is to get to the root, the human is the root of, the, of, of himself. The idea, Marx's Copernican turn is about turning to the human being, um, again, I want to to avoid the sort of worries about humanism, not in a self congratulatory or even I think in a way that says it's not about human exceptionalism. It's about this 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 it's a point about self consciousness and self determination. Um, the that we turn to the human, the human is the root of themselves, or we take a Copernican turn where we revolve around ourselves as our own real son, as he says. 
um, not because we're narcissists or because the hum human beings are the most important, but because human beings are the source of their own activity. Human beings determine their own conditions of action. Human beings are self-determining. And so that's the point that I think he wants to get across when he sort of wants us to say, right, that the root of the human is the human, um, when he says that there's a Copernican turn towards the human. Um, all of these things, I, I would read them not as about human exceptionalism or right putting putting right or a kind of narcissistic turn to the human, but it's about the ways in which human productive activity for Marx is self-consciously self-determined. Um, there's a, also another great reference in that text that you quoted from about um, a new categorical imperative, right? Obviously also making reference to Kant's categorical imperative, but basically saying that, that the categorical imperative is to prevent all conditions in which human beings are, he says, humiliated, despised, basically uh, all that the new categorical imperative is to um, prevent and uh, stop all forms of dehumanization. That, that's how I would read the way that Marx is um, presenting his new categorical imperative there. Um, so that's that's sort of to try to right take Marx be say that Marx is both extending Kant's conception of critique, but also really moving beyond it. I don't want to make Marx too much of a Kantian. The point about materializing philosophy, I think that, that this passage that you read, in a way, he seems to think that. Theory becomes material when it's gripped the masses. And this, of course, in this text, this early text is also very famous for presenting something like a very early and nascent conception of the proletariat and of class consciousness. It's clear that Marx seems to think that what is the way that theory can grip the masses, um, the way that we, in another passage from that text, he says that we have to um, teach the people to, to become shocked by themselves, to become aware of the oppressive conditions that they live under. And so I think what he's suggesting is that theory, uh, when it speaks to questions of dehumanization, <laughs> when it speaks to questions about um, human suffering, the ways in which human beings are being impeded in their self-determining activity, he seems to think that once we're, that's no longer right, pure theory, uh, because in a way it's material because we're talking about ourselves, we're talking about our own activity, we're talking about something that presumably we can, we can all feel, we can all understand. There is a lot of reference in that text to feelings of indignation, and that in a way part of becoming self-conscious is to become aware of the ways in which the conditions that we created are oppressive, and to feel right the the forms of indignation that should he thinks come along with that, and so he seems to think that a humanist in in the sense that I want to talk about, um, the, in the sense that I want to interpret him, um, humanist philosophy in that sense is a kind of materialist philosophy precisely because it's about you know going back to the right it's about real living human individuals. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So I think in answering that question about critique, I think so. you've been building in, I think, quite a lot of sort of structure in terms of what, what the human is and how, how this notion of the human functions for Marx. So, I mean, thinking in part about um, the way in which the proletariat comes in in that text. And it is, as you say, it's the, it's the place where that idea first appears that somehow the proletariat is the universal class because um, you know its chains are radical and, and as, as you'll later put it, they have nothing to lose. Um, and that I think starts to sort of get into view the notion that there's something um, perhaps quite complex seeming or, or perhaps it's a very fundamental and straightforward um, feature of, Kant's account, uh, of Marx's account, depending on how you look at it. But there seems to be this very important sort of interplay between the universal and the particular. This is something that you emphasize in, in your work on this topic. Um, and one thing that you talk about is the way in which in um, social struggles, it becomes important for the struggle to be thought of as the struggle in some sense of the human as such or the human qua human, um, and to think of um, oppression in sort of universal terms. Um, and I mean, that might seem surprising Right? You might think that well, if you're involved in some kind of struggle, one group against another group could be quite 
um, culturally and historically specific? Um, you know, why, why does the universal, why does the human as such come into this at all? So I'm just intrigued um, to hear you say a bit more about um, how, how, the, how the universal and the particular relate and, and why the universal plays this, plays this role. So I think here, Marx gives us a good model for beginning to think about this, but I would also want to move beyond Marx um, to, to sort of think about how this idea develops. So you're right that defending sort of different forms of universalism is itself also very complicated. We know that Marx is going to be very much opposed to, in the same way that he's opposed to sort of pure th abstract, <laughs> pure theory, he's going to be uh, opposed to right, purely abstract, something like abstract universals. He clearly thinks that the human is not an abstract universal um, in the way that some other idea, right? Something, this is something he, 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 he will make reference to later, right? Something about the ideas of universal equality um, or universal human dignity are abstract universals. But the idea of a human being itself for Marx is not an abstract universal, but a concrete universal. <laughs> we could get into a very long, uh, complicated philosophical discussion about what a concrete universal means. One thing that in, in right a, a very general sense, one thing that it definitely means, it's that it's, as you were just uh, pointing out, the universal is not separate. We don't think of universality in distinction from the particular, but sort of in this essential, <laughs> you know, if I use this term, dialectical relationship with the particular, um, that it's a form of universality that we that can only be grasped when it's inseparable from the particular. Um, in the history of philosophy, the models for this so if we th and i think there's a long tradition of thinking about concrete universals from aristotle through to hegel and i think marx adopts this in a certain way um it's no so this very idea of species and species and genus concepts um aristotle called them secondary substances but there's something about genus and species concepts that in a certain tradition these are not abstract universals in the sense that we can only really understand and grasp them as instantiated in the particular um, that that is an exemplar instance of the um, concrete universal. Um, another example in the history of philosophy that I think is very interesting and that um, I don't talk too much about um, in, in this paper that Anthony mentioned is beauty. I think beauty is another, uh, philosophers seem to realize that beauty is also not a universal that that really we can't really understand beauty as an abstract universal because beauty is always somehow attached even though it's a universal it's a concrete universal that's always attached to some particular beautiful thing so that's a very so that's the more that's the sort of philosophical context in which i want to think about uh, the problem of the concrete universal um, more concrete, more co even more concretely thinking about um, how this plays out in a theory of the proletariat or thinking about social struggles more broadly. Um, clearly Marx thinks that the proletariat is a kind of concrete universal. Um, I'm not sure that I would want to take on every, you know, I, I think it's, it's a very complex concept, so I'm not sure that I want to take on everything that he says about the proletariat. One thing that I think is um, helpful is that he does seem to think that whatever the human being, whatever the universal human being is, um, it has to be one, right, attached to particular social struggles. And so that's one way in which the universal human being gets concretized, um, precisely because it gets concretized through a particular social movement or social struggle. Another thing is that there is a, it, he primarily articulates the universal of humanity in negativist terms. Um, he talks about, especially going back again to that crucial text that you, you quoted from, there he talks about universal, it's, he says that their sufferings are universal. Um, they suffer no particular wrong, but it's a universal wrong. So the universality there is also concretized in this, in, in this negative sense of not articulating positively what universal humanity is, but we give content and concreteness to something like a sense of universal humanity by understanding right forms of universal forms of human suffering because i think he thinks that although the proletariat 
are is the class that is bearing the brunt of this human suffering. He thinks that this is this is a form of universal human suffering in that any human being would suffer under those conditions. Um, I started by saying that I would also want to take this idea of a concrete universal, tying the idea of universality to concrete um, social struggles beyond Marx. I think the work of Franz Fanon is also another really good example of trying to develop this idea of a concrete universal humanity and why it's important for, for social movements and social struggle. Fanon very famously um, talks about this idea of a new humanism that he thinks gets articulated through struggles for de struggles against um, uh, colonization so that decolonization struggles help us, uh, right, is very, as you said, very particular historically, socially, culturally, <laughs> politically specific in all kinds of ways. But that social struggle in being particular helps us to articulate something like a, what he calls a new humanity or a new humanism. And I think that's the sense of um, humanism that I would want, that, that's the sense of universality um, that I would want to defend when thinking about uh, the problem of humanism. Great. So, so I think in just a couple of minutes, we should probably expand this and, and bring in other uh, questions from other people. Uh, but I just wanted to just very briefly ask you a thing um, which I'm intrigued about and I think other people might be intrigued about, um, which is sort of um, where you see things going in terms of your intellectual trajectory, the kind of projects that you're working on from now, just thinking, um, sort of thinking back to um, the way in which um, some of this work that you're doing that's much more focused on Marx has in some way grown out of um, work that you've done on Hegel, so in particular, um, really wonderful book, um, Hegel's Concept of Life, which came out in 2020. Um, and I'm just curious if you could give us any sort of pointers um, towards um, where, we, where we should expect you to be taking some of this material in the future. Um, well, unsurprisingly, I am work. I'm at the beginning stages of working on a project of um, rethinking this concept of species being in Marx, um, thinking about how it transforms this tradition of classical German philosophy and critical theory. So that if instead of self, if instead of placing self consciousness <laughs> at the center of um, this question of critique, if we place this idea of species being at the center of um, the concept of critique, what does that mean? Um, you're right that I, it, uh, hopefully, I think it, it does grow out of some of the work I've done on Hegel um, in my book, which focused on this uh, concept of life, this or, organic, I tried to basically in the book, I tried to defend um, a kind of uh, organic, a defensible kind of romantic organic conception of nature <laughs> that I thought um, was actually very important for understanding Hegel's philosophy. Um, and even Hegel's rationalism. Um, so I focus a lot on the science of logic. Um, when I was, maybe I'll, I'll talk about, when I was in graduate school, um, I read this book by Alfred Schmidt called Marx's Concept of Nature. Um, and a lot, most of that book is, a lot of that book is about Hegel's <laughs> philosophy of nature. And I think that would be the, the, the way that, I, that I, I think that many of the arguments that I, I, I think that I made in the book where I tried to show, I guess, present a more naturalist Hegel, but naturalist in a very specific sense, that word is very obviously difficult to pin down. Um, but that in thinking, in arguing that this organic conception of nature, that the concept of life is so central for Hegel, um, I think that this is the concept of nature um, that that Marx sort of adopts. Um, I think it's the way that Marx thinks of human beings as being a part of nature. Um, and so that might that would, would be the way that I, I'm hoping that this next <laughs> project builds on and continues on some of um, that builds on that book. Um, but we'll see where it goes. <laughs> that sounds very exciting. I mean, we didn't talk at all about things like, you know, our relationship with nature and, and the complex ways in which um, um, well, I think things that that works and so on. Um, but um, let's go to um, some of the questions that people have been um, sending in. Um, so I thought we could start um, with a question from um, Faye Douglas. And I should say, I, I'm going to read out people's names and I am going to mispronounce some of them. So I, I, I apologize for that. Um, but this question I thought uh, might be helpful because it, it brings in a concept which I don't think we mentioned and that's very central. Um, is the humanism you defend a way of overcoming alienation? Um, and what might unalienated human life look like? 
I've really enjoyed this conversation. So, um, yeah, well, how does alienation come into this? That's great. I, you're right. I'm surprised we, <laughs> we didn't talk about alienation, um, which is such a central concept for the humanist Marx. Um, as always, you know, Marx himself, as is well known, <laughs> didn't tell us all that much about what an alienated, un, an unalienated human life might look like. Um, most of the things that he says are very, are quite abstract. One of the things that I think unalienated human life would look like would, for example, be, you know, the self-conscious appropriation of our productive forces. <laughs> that, that almost sounds like a, that answer is almost like a kind of definitional kind of answer, not a substantive one. Um, but I think it's, uh, you know, many people have talked about this. It's not unsurprising that Marx didn't talk too much about uh, what an unalienated life would look like. Um, but about specific forms of alienation and how we might overcome those. Um, that sort of is the space. So identifying the specific forms of alienation and then right, working towards overcoming them, that would be the specific space in trying to think about an unalienated life. Um, so I, my answer here might be a bit disappointing. Um, there are lots of general things we might say. You know, clearly Marx thought that an un we could not live an unalienated life under capitalism. Um, but that again is very general um, that we, we, we don't know what that looks like. But maybe going back, I will say the, the reason I think that this question of um, self-consciousness is so important is because alienation, it seems to me that self-consciousness and alienation are kind of concepts that go together. We can't really understand the problem of alienation, right? Why it is that only certain kind, right? We can, um, we can give different kinds of examples where we might be suffering, but we wouldn't call that suffering alienation. It seems to me that the very problem of alienation only arises for once we have beings that relate to their activities <laughs> in a self-conscious way, can we have a pathology like alienation as opposed to just say, well, we can say that, um, I'll, I'll use the animal example. If, if, we, if we take a certain kind of unconscious animal, that unconscious animal might be suffering, but we wouldn't necessarily say that they're alienated. Um, to be alienated already suggests that that's a more complicated form of social suffering that um, involves self-consciousness in some way. So um, that's, I think that's what I would say to that. Um, but I'm not sure what an unalienated life looks like. <laughs> okay, let's move to another question. So Frederick Bartlett um, said, um, I see lots of crossovers between humanism and liberalism e.g. aspirations to human universals, as well as accusations that these are in fact false universals, e.g. colonial critiques. Um, is the humanism you defend one rooted in a reformed liberalism as a political philosophy, or can it be part of a more revolutionary politics? Great question. Um, I definitely want... Uh, um... So when I mentioned that Fanon gives us a great, maybe even a better model than the, the sort of politics of the concrete universal um, than, than Marx. Um, this idea of false universals, I should have said, I mostly talked about the worry about abstract universals. Um, false universals are obviously also deeply problematic. Um, I think the, sorry, I forgot the name of the questioner. The question is absolutely right. Um, and, and this is what makes Fanon such an interesting thinker. Fanon is deeply critical of abstract universals. He, he, does, he doesn't seem to think that simply, you know, drawing on ideas of human dignity or human equality are going to help in the context of anti-racist and decolonial struggles. He also is deeply, deeply critical of forms of European bourgeois humanism that are basically what the questioner rightly called false universals. And so I think there is a different way of thinking about humanist uh, and, and, and universalism that is more, it, it's, that can be more revolutionary um, to use the words in the question. Um, and one possible model for that, I think is in the work of Fanon um, because he is a decolonial thinker who is high, deeply critical of false universals of, of racist 
uh, European bourgeois forms of humanism, but nonetheless still seems to think that the project of decolonial anti-racist struggle has to make reference to the concept of the human, um, that it does, that it simply does not, um, that, that we can't really get a grip on what makes racism and colonialism so harmful and oppressive without reference to something like a human being, even if it's an idea of a new human being, right, that has to be sort of constructed out of um, a liberatory struggle. Um, so I definitely think that it, it's, um, I don't want to get trapped in certain labels, right? It was, you know, was Hegel a liberal or was he, right? Hegel, Hegel is all kinds of, it's, it's impossible to label Hegel. So without sort of latching on to, um, to latching on too much to certain labels, I certainly think that a universalist humanist um, philosophy can, can be one of revolutionary uh, social struggle and not just say, right, uh, more reformist or, or liberal politics. I'm just going to keep on firing away other people's questions at you because they're such great questions. I don't want to get in the way of them. So I'm just um, I'm going to give you one from um, Rastislav Dinich. Uh, do you see any connection between your defense of humanism and Bernard Williams's defense of the human prejudice? At a crucial point in that text, so his text for human prejudice, um, Williams also underlines the capability of oppressed classes of human beings to actively struggle for their own liberation, as opposed to say animal liberation, that animals themselves will never be able to join. Um, I, get, I get you sort of touched on issues about um, human prejudice, speciesism and so on, just quite briefly along the way. And, and perhaps this is a chance to, to, to return to some of that. So I definitely think that the, the importance of part of the reason, part of the reason why something like self-consciousness is important is because it, right, it, it, it reminds us of our ability to overcome the conditions that, um, the, the, the conditions that we've created that are conditions that also oppress us. That's the sort of deep paradox of human freedom that we we have this human freedom to create the conditions of our own activity and our own thinking, but those very conditions can then right impede us and work against us in all sorts of ways. But then of course we have the ability to become aware of that and on and on it goes. So I absolutely think that that is part of why um, why the question of self consciousness, um, if we want to call, we we could go with we could go with this idea of the human prejudice. Um, I haven't talked much about animals. I don't think humanism. Um, I've tried to argue in the paper that Anthony mentioned, and I'm not the only one who's tried. Lots of other people have argued this that there is absolutely no. Um, entailment, there's no necessary connection between a certain way of understanding humanism in the way that I think Marx did and um, problematic speciesist um, ways of thinking. Um, that's why I tried to emphasize it, right? When he says, when Marx says that we that the root of the human being is the human themselves, it's not about saying that therefore humans are at the top of some sort of hierarchical, right, um, order of being. It's just about um, it, it's about a formal point about beings who are able to self-consciously appropriate the conditions of their own activity and to become aware of them. Um, I will leave it as an open question uh, <laughs> whether or not there are creatures other than human beings that can do that. My sense uh, is that there are. <laughs> um, uh, there are other that there are other self-conscious species. <laughs> Um, who, right, to some degree uh, are aware, right, ha have have these kinds of capacities that we might want to, um, that, that are, are traditionally only associated with human beings. Um, so I just don't think that there's any necessary connection between a humanist, uh, whether it's a humanist Marx or humanist approaches in general, and speciesist positions that place human beings at the center in the sense that human beings are the most important or human beings are the only creatures that matter or that human beings are the only creatures of moral importance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's really just a point. I, I would, I, let me add one more thing. So it's a point about being able to self-consciously appropriate the conditions of our own activity. 
It's also a point about species specificity. I think there's another sort of claim going on in the idea of species being where we can only understand the specific harms, say, of capitalism if we understand um, certain needs of human beings. So that's just a very general point. We can only understand um, how right some creature is flourishing or failing to flourish if we understand something about what it is for that kind of thing to flourish or fail to flourish. So there's also a claim about species specificity. I didn't talk much about that, but um, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> there might be all sorts of complicated claims that one would need to make about how one species treats another species, right? which is not, that's not written into the, the, the concept of species being in any very straightforward way, but like- Absolutely. Going to figure, we, we live with them, so that's going to be, it's going to be something that it is for us to treat them well and so on. Um, so I, I think this leads quite nicely into a question that's on one of our big topics, which is self-consciousness, um, which you were just talking about. Um, so this is from Josh Soffer. In thinking about the basis of self-consciousness, doesn't the self that returns to itself in reflection come back already altered by the socio-cultural environment? Um, if so, then is self-consciousness not a social construct? Um, no, <laughs> one, so, well, you know, the, the Hegelian, yes and no, <laughs> um, this, this is a question I've thought a lot about, um, both in my book and in my reading, um, on, on the, the on, in classical German philosophy, um, it's very important for this account of self-consciousness that I find in figures like Hegel and Marx, that self-consciousness is, is fundamentally, so there's no break between self-conscious, we, we, we can't go back, whatever self-consciousness is, it can't be Cartesian, right? We, we, we can't think of self-consciousness in a Cartesian way where there is some uh, radical break and, and, and really a dualism between whatever self-consciousness is and then whatever um, non-self-conscious nature is. Um, one of the things that I found so interesting about Hegel is the way in which he sees um, a connection between the reflexive activity, the, the activities of life that also return into themselves and are reflective to a certain degree, and the activities of self-consciousness that, um, as this questioner says, returns to themselves. Um, now, of course, once self, when self-consciousness returns to itself, it's become socially mediated in all, mediated in all kinds of ways. Um, does that mean it's purely a social construct? No. Um, in, in both Hegel and Marx, I think there's a lot of text that shows that self-consciousness, the very idea of self-consciousness only makes sense if we can think about it, right, in relationship to that which is not self-conscious, right, so it's never, it's never going to be fully self-consciously appropriated. Um, we, we never uh, fully leave nature behind, so to speak. There's always, in order for self-consciousness to reflect and have be, be contentful reflection, it has to reflect on something that is not fully self, right, not fully mediated by self-consciousness, um, whether we think of that as um, uh, certain, right, necessities of life, whether we think about that as certain constraints uh, placed on us by our natural environment. So I think um, against, I would say, a kind of social constructionist reading of Marx, which one can have, right, there's lots of places where um, Mark sounds a lot like a social constructionist. British need beer, French need wine. So, right, what are what what is natural? There's nothing natural about this. This is all socially mediated and self-conscious. Um, but I think there is a lot of room to sort of rather than think about it as social construction uh, or socially mediated all the way down. Ra rather, I want to think about it in terms of a dialectic between what is self-conscious and what remains sort of not fully captured or me mediated by self-consciousness. Great, so there's a question from uh, Oscar Ralda, and this question um, raises an issue about religion, which I think quite nicely, um, in a way, takes us back to the beginning of this text that we refer to several times, the critique of Hegel's philosophy, right, an introduction, right, which begins by talking about the critique of religion uh, in the time in which Marx is writing. And Oscar asks, um, how do you see the relation between Marx's critique of the 
Um, Marx's critique of the critique of religion, I'm not sure if that's a um, deliberate uh, replication, uh, which he claims has been completed in the Germany of his day and his adoption of a humanist perspective. Um, hi, Oscar, I can't see you, <laughs> but um, thanks for that. Um, I think they're very much connected. Um, Marx says that the critique of religion, um, and I take it that maybe the, the critique of the critique of religion might be deliberate because the Marx says the critique of religion is the beginning of all critique, um, but he is of course also critical of the way that the that the German philosophy of his time is criticizing religion um, in the sense of mere right the we're we're just criticizing ideas rather than criticizing political social reality. Um, but I I think that the humanist sorry. I was going to say he's critical of critical critique. Exactly. <laughs> Um, we'll just keep adding <laughs> critique of critique of critique. Um, so I think I, I, I think the humanist standpoint is very much connected with that set of problems. Um, the critique of religion, sir, why is the critique of religion the beginning of all critique? Um, the way that I always try to answer this is that, well, um, in order for things to be criticizable, we have to see them as made by us and not made by God. That seems a very straightforward point, but I feel like it bears repeating and re remind, <laughs> we, we always have to remind ourselves of that because um, otherwise we can fall into um, other, other forms of, so even when we think it's not made by God, we still think the structures are somehow just there independent of our own doing. So the critique of religion is important because only that which is created by human beings only can can be criticizable and and remade. Um, if it were in fact the case that this was a divine order, uh, that capitalism was a divine that that right the that um, our, our monarchy is a divine order. Right, all of these. If, if it were the case that all of these things were in fact divine orders, it actually seems that the very idea of critique. Um, and and uh, right, radical social change can't really get off the ground. The second reason for the critique of religion is really about a critique of theodicy, um, that it's a critique of any attempt to justify preventable forms of human suffering. Um, and so that is, right, that I, I think both of those things cut to the heart of this question of humanism. Um, the first one is, uh, again, a reminder, hopefully an empowering reminder, that although the, con the oppressive conditions are ones, uh, right, are, are, so, sorry, although we live, we may live under oppressive conditions that render us unconscious in all kinds of ways, we have the power to appropriate those conditions and to change them. The second um, goes back to that idea of the categorical imperative that, right, to be to, the critique of the Odyssey, sort of the critique of the Odyssey and the new categorical imperative that Marx talks about goes together. Um, we have to, um, all forms of preventable human suffering, the example that he talks about there is about poverty, right? Um, Clearly, any attempts to justify this kind of suffering, whether and it doesn't have to be a religious theodicy, it can be a political theodicy, historical, right? So we, we, can, we can do theodicy in many different kinds of ways. So I think the critique of religion really gets to uh, cuts to the heart of the question of humanism as well.